Okay. All right. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. I'm County Commissioner Justin Rodriguez, Precinct 2. Thank you so much for joining us this evening or this late afternoon. Uh, we had a long commissioner's court meeting, uh, but we wanted to make sure and provide you with an opportunity um, to get a little bit of information as we um, enter tax season. I know over the last few weeks, you have probably received your, your appraisal notice. Um, it's always um, uh, kind of a, a, an interesting time of the year. We got fiesta going on, but those are important uh, notices that go out from the appraisal district. Uh, let me mention at the outset, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we are recording this, and in case we lose lose the feed because you know it's technology, we're going to uh, make sure that this is posted both on YouTube and on our Facebook um, uh, page so that you can access it later on if you choose to do so. Uh, but let me first introduce a couple of our uh, guests who are here with us this afternoon. Um, first, of course, um, our elected um, tax assessor collector, Albert Udeste, is with us, and you'll be hearing from Albert a little bit later in this uh, program. Thank you, Albert, for joining us. Um, and then we're also joined by Gary Rivas, who's the president of SWBC's Ad Valorum Tax Advisor uh, Department. Um, Gary is going to walk us through probably not to take anything away from Albert, because there's some great programs available for relief, but I think you're probably most interested in um, what kind of uh, effective uh, protest you can make with as it relates to your um, appraisal, your assessment. Uh, let me also give the disclaimer, because uh, we always have to do this. Those appraisal notices do not come from uh, the county. There's a lot of confusion because they're called Bear County Appraisal Districts. They don't come from my office. They don't come from Albert's office. There is a separate uh, Bear, Bear County appraisal district that is governed by a board of directors and is separate uh, from the county. I know it's confusing because it, it goes by BCAD, Bear County appraisal district. Um, but uh, we do obviously rely on property taxes here at the county to, to uh, deliver services to you all. Um, so it's an important um, interface, but they're separate. Um, and we want to make sure we help you um, effectively uh, protest your appraisals if it's justified. So that's what the purpose of this is. Um, so let me talk briefly about um, what the calendar looks like. I mentioned that you're, you're getting your appraisal notices. Um, what's happened since the beginning of the year is um, there is a process by which um, the, the notices or uh, the valuations are identified. Um, that's done, uh, as, as you might be aware, sometimes there's not, uh, at least this, uh, it doesn't appear to be a much rhyme or reason, but they're, they're typically done by uh, looking at comparable sales in your area. Uh, so the appraisal district does that. Um, then they send out those notices, which you've received over the last few weeks. Um, May 15th is your deadline to respond to those appraisal notices. So we're right here in the, in the last few weeks of doing that. What happens after that is what's called the equalization phase. The appraisal district takes those uh, protests. You'll have a hearing, either formal and in informal. Um, and then by the end of July, um, those are settled uh, for the most part. And um, the appraisal district uh, lets, lets folks know, taxing entities like the school districts, the counties, the cities, what the appraisal ro role is, and it's uh, certified. Uh, then, then we go into an assessment phase where, whereby the appraisal roles um, are received, tax rates are adopted by government entities, and um, tax, tax bills begin to, to be sent out to taxpayers. Um, and then, of course, going into the fall in October, that's where Albert's office gets really busy. You guys are always busy, but um, that's when the taxes are collected. Um, you look at uh, potential penalties for nonpayment. Uh, late payment and things of that nature. But again, Albert's going to talk a little bit about what his office does to help you through that process. Um, so that's kind of the, the 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 way the year rolls out. It's a it's the appraisals, equalization, assessment, and then collection in a very simple um, format. But I know you're all mostly interested in how to effectively protest your your appraisal. Um, it seems, at least anecdotally, from what I'm hearing from constituents. Uh, appraisals are still high. They're not as um, high as they were last year, uh, but I want to have Gary Rivas uh, walk through that with us. Um, I think, Gary, you have some information to share. Again, Gary's with SWBC. He's doing this as a public service. So, Gary, thank you for joining us. 
Um, if you have some uh, information to screen share, you should be able to do that, but I'm gonna go ahead and, and turn it over to you now, Gary. Great, thank you, Francesco. If you'll please bring up those slides, that'd be great. Uh, Commissioner, a great summary of the uh, overview of the whole appraisal process. I'm gonna jump right in, in the interest of time. Uh, with uh, how to protest. What do we need to do to file a protest? And, and not only that, to be successful at it. And this particular component is uh, would be in the equalization stage of the uh, over of the uh, property tax process. And uh, like you said, uh, present notices have been uh, mailed out to a majority of the property owners out there. And we'll tend to focus on uh, the residential sector today. Um, and if you recall last year, I think we, uh, you know, across the, the county, uh, increases to uh, residential properties were about 26% or greater. They're still going to be up this year, uh, not to that level. I think we're there, the appraisal district is anticipating uh, increases in the residential market from at about 13 to 15%. But uh, if you'll go to the first slide. We will jump into uh, the um, uh, the target date of the appraisal, which is January 1. So the appraisal district employs a mass appraisal to, uh, methodology to where that means that they don't have the luxury of going to each individual property and looking at it and understanding all the characteristics involved with it. So they employ a set of, of data and, and apply those market sales and, and market factors and apply them um, basically fairly evenly across the board, at least that's their intention. But that is all based off of a January 1 target date. Um, if literally in, in today's world, if the house burned down on January the 2nd, you could be appraised for the entire year, even though it only existed on January 1. We'll probably see some changes to that in the future. And in fact, there is one exception that exists today, which is the temporary exemption for qualified property damaged by a natural disaster. So if the governor declares a particular county a state of emergency, um, appraisal districts must, um, upon request, must um, reappraise properties that were potentially damaged. And they're in increments of 15%, I believe 15% for level one, 30% level two, 60% for level three, and up to 100% if the property is completely destroyed. And if you remember a couple of years back during our SNOVID, um, many properties were, were damaged because of bursting pipes, which did cause significant damage. Uh, things like hurricanes also can be uh, causes to trigger this type of exemption. So that's kind of the exception to where they can appraise after January 1. Uh, next slide, please. Notice of protest. Uh, as the commissioner stated, May 15th is the last day to file your notice of protest without uh, being delinquent. If, there are some circumstances that uh, if you miss this deadline that uh, you might be able to file a protest, but you don't wanna go there. They're extremely hard to uh, reach the benchmarks that are set. Um, and nine times out of 10, most properties will not qualify. Uh, for late protest, but uh, it's May 15th is a deadline, midnight up to midnight of May 15th. That means if you need to go hand deliver a, a, uh, a protest by mail, you can actually go to the airport post office, which is open till I be, believe about 10 o'clock uh, to file a protest. And it must be postmarked on May 15th. So for those people that like to mail in their protests uh, on the day or two before the deadline, I would highly recommend that if you are going to mail them, mail them via certified mail, so you can um, you have you can document that it was postmarked prior to May fifteenth. Um, or the other option is uh, if you received your value notice late, uh, they must at least give you thirty days um, from the time that that uh, value notice was delivered. Not necessarily when you receive it. You might receive it a week after it was actually delivered in the mail. So on the upper left-hand corner of the uh, notice of appraised value, you will see a date of, the, of uh, that that uh, notice was generated. So I would count 30 days from that date on that notice uh, to file your protest. Uh, you can uh, file the protest in several different ways. One of them is you can hand deliver to uh, to the appraisal district, uh, I won't say in person, but to their Dropbox, 
which is located at the front of their building. Uh, they prefer that you file your protest on their using their online services portal, uh, bcad.org on their website. And that's a fairly uh, simple, intuitive process that you can do that. Uh, you can also upload your evidence that you intend to submit and you would like the appraisal district to consider when um, uh, you're, you're, you're protesting online. Um, okay, notice of protest. The uh, notice of appraised value uh, comes with a notice of protest form that you can basically just turn it around, fill it out and send it back to the appraisal district. And I would like to point out that um, at the top of the page and at the bottom of the page, there is a box that says evidence requested. That is extremely important. I think that it, it might even be in, in red font. But what that means by checking that box, evidence requested, you are requiring that the appraisal district send you the information that they used to come up with your appraised value. So if they've got market sales that they say, hey, we raised your value because of the market sales indicated that, that it, it should be at, at, at this value, they must provide you at least 14 days before your, your formal hearing, they must provide you with the evidence that they use to come up with that value. They will also provide you with a list of, of similar properties uh, in your, should be in your neighborhood to find out if the uh, level of appraisal is equal with comparable properties to yours. So both, the, the, we just talked about two methods to protest. One of them is a market value which you would look at, uh, you know, obviously the market sales, which you can, uh, the best source of market sales really is from uh, the board of realtors, uh, a realtor um, who has access to the multiple listing system can provide that information. Um, that's uh, the best place to, to go for that information. But again, that evidence packet that you're requesting will also have that information. Next slide, please. So a lot of detail here, and I know we have limited time, so I'll go over these pretty quickly. Uh, again, January 1, is the, that's the date of the appraisal for, for your property. Um, April and May, that's when the value notices are sent, and you should start hitting your mailboxes. May 15th, protest deadline. June, you start meeting. Uh, you can request meetings with the, uh, uh, with the appraisal district. To, well, in the old days, before COVID, you could actually go down to the appraisal office and sit down, you know, just across from the appraiser and hammer it out. You know, you provide your evidence, you lay out your pictures, lay out your, your whatever information you have, and you just work it out there. Well, due to COVID and, and still health concerns, the appraisal district uh, at this time is not allowing in-person uh, informal meetings. Uh, however, they do allow you to submit that information via their online portal. Um, same, same information. It's just a little more, got to be a little bit more tech savvy, but it, uh, you, you, you can do that information. But uh, you, you upload all that information. The appraisal district will review it, and they will provide you with a settlement offer. So you have an option to either um, accept the offer that uh, that they're proposing, or if you don't like the number that they're saying, um, then you can continue to on with the formal hearing with the the ARB or the Appraisal Review Board. Uh, sounds scary, but it really isn't. It's just a panel of three uh, unbiased uh, citizens who basically act as a jury. They listen to both sides. Uh, the appraisal district will present their evidence. The uh, uh, property owner presents it, his evidence. Uh, it goes pretty quickly. Usually these meetings don't last more than about 15 minutes uh, total. So all in all, you may have five to seven minutes to present your, your evidence and of which the, the uh, ARB will evaluate both sides. They may ask you questions um, and they will reach a conclusion. Uh, at that point, that the decision on the value is final. Um, there, there's, they'll close a hearing and their decision is final unless you don't agree with that value and you would like to continue to pursue that, of which there's uh, really a couple of ways to do that. One of them is uh, binding arbitration, uh, of which is a very economical way to continue that argument if you believe that uh, the value they arrived at was unjust. 
or the other option is to file litigation, which typically is reserved for your higher dollar commercial properties. Uh, it's it's uh, much, much more expensive um, to, to take that route. Next slide. Uh, okay, well, hold off on that one. I, I, I have a, uh, information here that I'd like to share um, with you that didn't make the, the slides here. Uh, so here are some tips on uh, uh, that will help you have a successful value protest. So you've understood the process of, of what you need to do to, to uh, file the appeal. But uh, first and foremost is when you get your notice of appraised value, understand it to the best of your ability. And I tell you, even when I get these notices of value, I'm even confused by them sometimes. I've, I've got one sitting right here. I, I look at it and I see a lot of information that even for me, a trained eye is very confusing. I have to almost decipher it. I see things like total market value, productivity value, appraised value, homestead cap value. Oh my gosh, when I had, when I, even for me, who, you know, somebody who's been doing this for over 30 years, I have to sit down and look at these and, and study it. But what you're most concerned with when you get this notice of appraised value is your total market value. That is the, 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 the appraisal district's opinion of what they think your property would sell for as of January 1, uh, based on a market sales or whatever information they're using. That is typically the value that you are trying to protest. Uh, the other values, you, the appraised value, the homestead cap value will fall in place. But when you're at your hearing, this is a number, this is the value that you're protesting. Um, Appraised value, that this gets a little bit complicated, but uh, the homestead cap values are generally one and the same. But uh, many people ask, well, you know, you just said that you know, the appraisal district may increase my value by 13% this year. Um, I thought you just, you know, there, isn't there something that limits the appraisal district from increasing my, my market value by 10%? And the answer to that is almost yes. <laughs> There is, there is a limitation for homesteads, and it is 10% above the prior year's uh, cap value or a, a appraised value, um, plus the cost of any new improvements that you may have added to the property. So let's go back and, and analyze that one more time. So you have an appraised value from last year. Uh, you have a homestead exemption in place. So by, by that homestead exemption, um, the appraisal district are, is, is prevented from assessing your taxes by greater than 10% um, because the homestead exemption cap is in place. Now, that doesn't prevent them from increasing the market value. They are charged with appraising the market value uh, at 100% of, of what their opinion market value is, but the homestead cap limits your taxable value increase to only 10%. And it's clear as mud and maybe uh, uh, the, the tax assessor can clarify that a little bit more. Those are questions that I'm sure you guys field all day long, but homestead caps can be, can be quite complicated, but they are extremely useful. Um, we'll come, we may come back and talk about that one a little bit later, maybe in, in some yeah. of the yeah, Gary, let me let me let me uh, give you a second to take a breath um, and just and just kind of expound on that because you're right. It's it's a it can be pretty confusing. Um, you mentioned that the the number really to focus on is total market value, right. and and I think that what what happens is a lot of times is you know let's say your your home is uh, uh, valued at two hundred thousand dollars one year, ne the next year they come back and it's um, uh, 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 the values. They're, they're basically estimating is three hundred fifty thousand dollars. Well, some people would say, well, you know, I'm not I'm not going to worry about it because they're capped at ten percent of um, you know year to year, right? There's there's by law by by the the, the state law they're capped. But um, your point is, at least my understanding is, you still probably should protest that because then. You know what happens is the following year you start at that at that new um, floor of of three fifty if you don't protest it right and so even though you're, you're what you're paying every year can only be capped at at ten percent year over year um, the the total market value can continue to go up right right, right. It, it absolutely makes sense to protest every year 
for the basis alone of just filing the protest, that constitutes what's called a reappraisal. Mm -hmm. So that 10% cap is 10% for each year and since the property was last appraised. Well, appraisal districts by law must appraise at least once every three years. Okay. So think about that. What if an appraisal district decided they weren't going to appraise a particular neighborhood for a couple of years? They took a year off and mm -hmm. uh, focused somewhere else. Well, when that value notice increases in a couple of years, you're act they can actually come back with a 20% taxable value increase which is 10 percent for yeah. each of those years so by filing a protest even if you you're not successful in getting a value reduction that still constitutes what's called you know reappraisal yeah, so right. you're still limiting that 10 percent uh on a yearly annual basis yeah one one of the questions um we have here is um someone wants to know how do they know if the settlement offer that they receive back from the appraisal district is a fair settlement offer? I mean, maybe that's in the eye of the beholder, but do you have right. any any um, comment on that, Gary? Yeah, really, that is a subjective uh, uh, matter. Um, you have to have had done your homework to really get an idea on whether or not you think they're giving you a fair value. Now you think what you're 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 protesting the market value. So really, there should be two exercises that are going on when you're pro when you're preparing your protest. One of them is trying to establish what is the market value for my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. On average, what are, what are properties selling for on a cost per square foot basis? Okay. So you, you want to find to that. Say they're they're appraising a majority of the neighborhood at, at $100 a square foot, but they have you at 110. Why? You know, everything, all things being equal, you need to be down there at that, you know, $100 level as well. So that's yeah. one approach to looking at it. The other one is to quantify the conditions. So what if you agree that, okay, it, it is $100 a square foot for the neighborhood, but they didn't know that I needed a new roof. They didn't know I had a cracked slab. They didn't know that I haven't updated my kitchens and bathrooms in 20 years. And so they may be assuming Right. that your property is on an equal par with everybody else, but it's up to the property owner to demonstrate and document yeah. why it should be less. So again, that goes back to saying, hey, well, I think it, it would cost you $20,000 to get my house in a condition to get that market value that they believe it's worth. So all that, you know, is based on yeah. the research that a property owner would do. So so, so good points. And in, in, um, I want to make sure we underscore that because I, I think what you mentioned at the outset, when you send in your protest, it's important to check that box evidence requested because in some ways they do the legwork for you, right? You don't have to right. go out and do your own research. And I've done this before. You get back, you you, you check that box, and you get a, a thick packet of materials back in the mail that shows a lot of the comparable sales in your neighborhood. As you mentioned, you can compare uh, price per square foot from your house to the next. And then the other important point you make, um, Gary, is the is the photographic evidence, right? And, I, and I've done this before too because we've got an older home um, taking uh, pictures of you know, uh, shingles that may need replacing or, you know, some wood rotting on, on the siding, uh, those kind of things. And it doesn't take professional photography, right? You can take these no. with your smartphone. Uh, so those kind of things are important as well um, for, for folks to know, right? Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you are going to put your house on a market, what conditions would you have to take care of first in order to get that top dollar? Okay. So it helps to quantify that. Pictures tell a thousand words, but but how do you put a dollar amount to that? Yeah. You know, I, I I need a new roof. I've got stains in my ceiling, but an estimate for for replacement sure goes a long way. Absolutely. Okay, so um, we're going to pause for a minute, um, Gary. Give you a second to to take a breath, and then I want to have Albert come in. We're not done talking about protests, but but I want to have Albert uh, Udeste come in and talk a little bit about. Um, some relief programs that his office has. By the way, let me just share with you all, uh, today we recognized Albert and his team, uh, his staff at the tax assessor collector's office uh, because they were recognized by the state of Texas Department of Motor Vehicles um, with a silver uh, medal, silver award uh, for being one of the top uh, tax assessor offices um, in the state. So uh, Albert, thanks for your work. Please relay 
our thanks to your team. Um, but I want to hand it over to you, Albert, just to share a few words um, and information about uh, relief programs that are available through your through your office. Okay, so first of all, Commissioner, thank you for what you're doing by trying to get the word out to our citizens. It's uh, you're to be commended for that effort, and I want to congratulate you on that. Uh, I think the the main thing, just follow up on what everybody said, May 15th, don't forget that day. As Gary said, if you don't protest by May 15th, I can tell you it'll be very, very difficult once you do that. I can't tell you how many people call my office on May 16th. Having said that, so we have here in Bear County, we have the most property tax payment plans of any county in the state of Texas. You know, obviously you can pay it all in, in one amount, but we have a half payment plan that applies to all people, whether it's your business personal, your residential, your commercial, you can pay half of your property taxes on November 30th and the second half on June 30th. We have about 85,000 people that participate in that plan. We also have a quarter payment plan. This is for senior citizens, disabled citizens, and disabled veterans. This allows you to pay your property taxes in four equal installments. And yet, then you see it right there in the slide. And then we also have the 10 month payment plan. I will tell you this 10 month payment plan is the only one in the state of Texas. And we think it's the only one in the country. We just haven't been able to ascertain that. But this 10 month payment plan allows for our senior citizens and our disabled to be able to make their uh, property tax payments in 10 equal payments. We also have a prepayment plan, which is uh, what we use for specifically for businesses and people that have their homes paid off. And the beauty of this, you can set it up for six months, four months, eight months. July comes around, you want to take a vacation, can't make a payment, no harm, no foul. But the thing about it is that it allows you to budget your money. In October, we're going to send you a bill and you'll pay the balance. So if we can go on to the next slide, I believe the next slide is the uh, uh, HAP program. And maybe we're not, but uh, while I'm, well, there you go. While we're waiting for that, I, one thing I failed to mention is, you know, when the commissioner talks about relief plans, if you're 65 and over or disabled and you're having problems buying your medicine, you're having, you know, problems buying your food, then don't pay your property taxes. How can we say that? You know, I'm the tax assessor collector, but I can tell you that if you're 65 and over by state law, you can defer your property taxes and not pay property taxes for the rest of your life. Now they don't go away, but the thing about it, if you're struggling with your, your property tax, I mean, sorry, with your buying your food and buying your medicine, then use this tax deferral. You can still pay on your taxes, but it's a great way to alleviate you of some of the burden. Plus, the interest rate is a lot lower. It's only 5%. You don't get any penalties. Now, there is a catch, though. Again, these taxes are only being deferred. They're not being erased. If you sell your home or if you pass away, your heirs have 180 days in order to pay off your property taxes. So if you don't, you're gonna get a lot of interest and a lot of penalties coming back. But again, if you're struggling, it's a great tool. And then finally, and I know we're very short in time, but finally, I do wanna talk about the Texas uh, HAF program. This is a program on that last slide that we had that will show you it's, it's a federal program where they gave $842 million to the state of Texas. And so we incorporated it into our office. And with this program, if you're delinquent on your property taxes or on your uh, mortgage, or even now new on your utility bills, because of COVID after January 21st, 2020, you can get up to $25,000 in property tax assistance you can get up to $65,000 in mortgage assistance and up to $10,000 in utility assistance. This is free. I say free. It's a grant, so it does not have to be paid back, but it's a great tool. And I can tell you, we've helped over 5,000 uh, families here in Bear County. We've uh, led the 
the uh, efforts in bringing over $50 million in mortgage assistance and tax assistance into Bear County. So it's a great tool. I encourage you to use it. The other, uh, in closing, I will tell you that if you come to our office, we will help you walk this, this uh, application and we'll walk you from step one all the way to the end. We know that 40 to 60% of our population does not have the internet, the scanner, the printer, and, and you know all the things that you need in order to file this because this application can only be filed online. But if you come into our office, we will help you. Again, Commissioner, I wanna thank you for allowing me to speak today and uh, you know anything that you know we can do to help our citizens we're always we're always happy to do it well uh, albert thank you that was a great uh, overview and and uh, please hang with us here a few more minutes because i want to uh, circle back and make sure people have the information to contact your office if they need assistance but i want to segue um gary back to you on um i, I think you were going to touch on on a few of uh what's happening uh, the bills that are that are kind of ongoing in the legislature um, and as we cue that back up, um, it, it, uh, we, had a, we had a question from uh, someone who mentioned that their valuations going up 30 to 40 percent, you know, back to back years. They're concerned about being priced out of their home, uh, being able to afford to live here. Um, so uh, the question they had is, you know, is this ever going to stop? Um, or is BCAD going to keep, uh, you know, increasing these things and 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 um, digging into uh, savings and until they can no longer afford to live here? Um, so it's a good question to kind of segue into into the legislature. Um, having served there, I know that there's uh, several um, bills out there that are still going uh, in the last uh, month or so of the legislative session. There's always some discussion about property tax reform. Um, you know, we can't, of course, unilaterally at the at the commissioner's court change the law. It has to be done in the legislature. Um, if we're going to get some sense of, um, uh, you know, a, a, a uh, reasonableness in appraisals, uh, appraisal reform has to be done at the legislature. Um, so, Gary, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the bills uh, that are still alive out there, what you're hearing. I know there is a um, and there always is every legislative session a showdown between the House and the Senate. Everybody thinks they've got the best idea. Um, and so um, if we can pull that up, I think you're gonna talk a little bit about some of the uh, the property tax uh, bills that are ongoing this uh, session. Yeah, you, you've, um, as a state rep, you've been there, done that. So you definitely see what it looks on the other side. Um, but uh, yeah, property tax relief was a, is a priority for the governor, uh, even going so far as to promise to provide the largest property tax cut in the history of Texas. That's a pretty bold statement. And uh, I, I don't know if that we're necessarily going, going to reach, <laughs> reach those levels, but uh, there, there, uh, you know, there are about 320 bills and joint resolutions that, uh, that at least touch on property tax. Uh, we definitely don't have time to talk about all those, but only a handful of those really uh, are the bread and butter the ones that uh, may have a, a significant impact on uh, taxpayers moving forward? So, uh, you know, the state's sitting on a 32, $32.7 billion um, uh, 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 surplus. And so the both chambers have different uh, methods of, of uh, what they want to do to provide uh, property tax cuts. So we'll start with the with the house plan here, they have a $17 billion package uh, wrapped up primarily in HB2 and HJR1, uh, which would lower the appraisal cap, which we were just talking about a few moments ago, from 10% to 5%. That, that's pretty significant um, from limiting the amount that your taxable value can increase year over year from 10% to only five. Uh, on top of that, they would also expand that benefit to owners of commercial real property. As of today, that only applies to your homestead owners, not people who own houses, but people who own and reside in their residence at the residence homesteads. So another component of that, uh, of uh, HB2 and HGR1, would that uh, it would also increase tax rate compression. Uh, tax rate compression is means basically that they are lowering, they're requiring 
taxing jurisdictions lower their tax rates. Um, for school districts last year, I think we saw an average roughly of about 3% reduction in, uh, in the tax rates. I didn't look at all of the, of the, um, the school districts, but I looked at uh, the big three or four and, and, and it was about a little over 3% that uh, the, 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 the tax rates are actually coming down. Um, HB2 does not apply to business personal property or inventories. Um, and just like you said, the uh, the Senate doesn't really think highly of this plan. They're they're not fans of appraisal caps, which uh, we don't, we don't have time to get in today. But it basically creates a a, a chapter thirteen type scenario that uh, California experiences, and um, they're, they're, uh, the Senate is not a big fan of that of that method. Um, here's a little side note here. Uh, you know, food for thought HB twenty two fifty three would make the chief appraiser of an appraisal district an elected official, making him directly accountable to, to their constituents. Um, Mr. Uresti understands that <laughs> very, very well. Absolutely. If he's not doing his job, um, his constituents are gonna let him know. But uh, I think with the awards that uh, he just received today for the motor vehicle division, I think equally could have been awarded to your property tax department as well. Because let me tell you, I work all over the state. In fact, I work all over the country, but uh, I, I'm in all of the major cities in, in, in the state of Texas and the Bear County Tax Office by far is the best, the friendliest, the easiest, the, the most successful uh, uh, tax office in the state, hands down. I'm not Great. telling you that just to blow smoke. People, they are good down there and they will help you. So if you need help, do go down there and, and ask them the questions. I believe you are letting people in the doors. Yes, we are. So, and, we, and, and we are recording this, right? You're going to make sure. <laughs> yeah, and, and one more. They are not the ones who raise your taxes. <laughs> it's exactly. just a collector. That's right, right. Okay, so for the Senate plan, uh, this one's kind of led by uh, the Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, and their package is a $16.5 billion. Uh, go to the next slide. Next please, slide, please. Yeah. Um, which is uh, primarily consisting of uh, SB3 and uh, Senate Joint Resolution 3, which would raise the homestead exemption. This is a, a different uh, methodology mm -hmm. of, of providing tax relief as opposed to the appraisal caps, but uh, raising the homestead exemption from 40,000 to 70,000. Now people, that, that's a big deal. This mm -hmm. is money that's staying directly in your pocket and not writing to the tax assessor collector. Uh, this is on top of the $15,000 increase that we experienced in the last legislative session where the exemption amount was, uh, was a, what was it, 25,000 and they raised it to 40. So, you know, I, I didn't do the math here, but we got to be pushing a thousand dollars, maybe over a thousand dollars in actual real property tax savings staying in your pocket. Uh, on top of that, um, SB3 would raise the over 65 for people age 65 and older and the disabled uh, from the current $10,000 exemption amount to $30,000. That also is a significant increase that triples uh, that exemption for uh, the disabled and, and uh, the elderly there. Um, this, this, uh, uh, this bill does not provide any cap relief for businesses. So this is more homestead friendly, trying to keep people in their homes, like you said, people being priced out. Uh, we get it, we, we see it. And I think this is a, a great way to try to keep uh, tax dollars in their pocket. SB4 would cut property tax rates by seven cents for every hundred dollars in valuation. Again, tax rate compression. These are huge. These, these are real world uh, savings. Uh, that reduce your property taxes. Um, there's also uh, funding 5.3 billion to make up for the chunk that uh, the uh, school districts uh, would not collect if, uh, if, uh, if they did uh, employ this uh, tax rate compression here. SB5 would cut uh, 1.5 billion in business property taxes by increasing their exemption amount from $2,500 to $25,000 for income producing uh, tangible personal property. So that's your business owners that own furniture, fixtures, machinery, equipment, inventories. Um, I kind of think this is a, a drop in a bucket 
I think uh, that number needs to come up much more substantially to make it more meaningful, but hey, I'm sure they'll take every penny they can get. Uh, and and here's, a, here's a little tidbit here, SB 1923 would repeal the ability of the chief appraiser and appraisal review boards uh, would prevent them from suing taxpayers uh, and filing counterclaims against people who file uh, 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 suits against them contesting their appraised value. So how would you feel like if, if, if you felt you didn't get a, a good value by the appraisal review board, um, you filed uh, suit in district court uh, to get the value corrected, and then the appraisal district turns around and files a counter suit against you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Certain appraisal districts kind of use that almost as a retaliatory uh, nature. I'm sure, you know, in, in, from their perspective, they, they think it's the right thing to do to make sure that all taxpayers are held accountable. But uh, they're weaponizing, I believe, you know, certain sections of the tax code that uh, I don't think were meant to do that. But uh, nevertheless, uh, that legislation is out there to try to prevent chief appraisers from uh, appealing or filing counterclaims against your simple appeal of, of, a, of, a, of evaluation. Yeah. Uh, it, the host of other myriad things on that, but uh, that, yeah, that's and, just right there. You know, I, I think what um, th those last couple of slides demonstrate, I think, um, you know, none of us have a crystal ball. You know, I have served in the legislature. There's never anything certain there, but um, I think there is um, a high probability that there is some tax relief that is passed either in the regular right. legislative session or it may get right. pushed to, to a special session. Um, as you mentioned, Gary, $33 billion uh, surplus. I think there is a political will from the legislature to put some of that money back in the, the pockets of taxpayers. Um, again, I think the, the distinction right now is you do it through appraisal caps or you do it through um, raising the homestead exemption. Um, so so I, I feel a little bit of um, you know hope that there's relief coming uh, I agree the pipe. yeah I, I, mean, I think they're at some point they're going to have to get together to you know and, and sit down and and work it out and uh, you know where there's a will there's a way and I don't right. think they want to go back and face their constituents that they didn't <laughs> provide <laughs> provide exactly. the tax relief that uh, that they had promised yeah so what I want to do kind of in our last few minutes is um, give some tech takeaways to folks who are who are, are watching and listening uh, number one, I mentioned, look, we don't have a, at the county level the ability to change the laws. We deal with uh, what we can. Um, but I wanted to point out to folks, you know, when you when you look at the, the totality of your of your tax bill, you know, when you look at that that pie, um, the lion's share of that is coming from your school district, whether you're in uh, San Antonio and North Side you know, it's somewhere probably around 60% of your tax bill. Then you've got a, a bunch of smaller slices that compromise the, uh, com comprise the city of San Antonio, um, maybe the Alamo Colleges District, Bear County, um, and uh, University Health is another, another one. So uh, what I wanted to mention is each of those taxing entities um, set a tax rate. And, and I know um, it's hard once you have a tax rate set to, to lower that uh, much. Um, but I know at the county, you know, our, our assessments right around 27, 28 cents per $100 uh, dollar valuation. Um, and last year we passed a 20% uh, homestead exemption. Um, and I want to be clear that we can only control our portion of that, right? So that's 20% homestead exemption on the, on the, on the county's uh, assessment. Um, so hopefully delivers a little bit of relief. Um, that'll be the first year with, with that, um, on the books. And so, um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying our best. Every little bit uh, adds up. We're trying our best to be uh, good stewards of your of your dollars as taxpayers, but also to be very uh, aware of the fact that uh, these appraisals uh, certainly uh, don't don't uh, help in, 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 in terms of your day to day expenses. That in conjunction with inflation uh, really uh, minimizes your, your purchasing power. So um, but what I want to do is mentioned that uh, the takeaways, Gary, from your perspective, and then Albert, I'll go to you, um, in terms of back to the protest, protest being uh, effective in your protest, um, if you wanna give just a, just uh, two or three takeaways uh, for folks who, who may have um, those forms in front of them and they're getting ready to send them in. 
Right. I, I think one of the one of the key things to remember is when you go to the appraisal review board or the even the meeting with the appraiser, you're there to talk about your property value. Do not talk about property taxes. Do not go to the board and complain about your taxes. This is a valuation dispute. And just remember that they've heard it time and time again. And it's one of the quickest ways to uh, essentially turn off the audience. They're, they're gonna stop listening to you. The other thing is, if you wanna gather honey, don't kick over the beehive. Meaning don't go in there uh, like a hot missile or you're gonna teach them a thing or two. Um, you may educate them on the characteristics of your property, but uh, uh, being courteous and professional goes a long way. If you treat them with respect and kindness, appraisers, the price staff generally and the ARB, they generally want to help taxpayers, but you got to give them something to work with. So you've got to do your homework, do your research, use that, get that information packet, analyze it, and present a good, credible, reasonable argument why it should be lower. And if you give them something to hang their hat on, I, I think uh, eight out of 10 times, you're going to be pleasantly surprised. You will be successful. Yeah, great, Gary. Um, Albert, uh, any closing thoughts in terms of, um, or, or you want to maybe just give out contact information on how folks can get in touch with your office? Um, of, get, of course, this is later in the year when they're when they're potentially looking for relief or payment options. Well, I just want to follow up real quick on the protest. Yep. That over eighty percent of people that protest their property values are successful in reducing the uh, taxable value of the property. So it's important, and a lot of it is done at the in, informal hearing. So it's important. Uh, we sent out 738,000 statements last year. The appraisal district sent out 670,000 value increase notices. So pretty much everybody's property went up. So just kind of keep that in mind. The uh, As far as the closing, I will tell you, our mission here at the Tax Assessor Collector's Office is to help keep families in their homes with an emphasis on helping our senior citizens, our disabled citizens, our veterans, and ultimately our children. This is what we do every single day. If you're having a problem and you want to, you know, don't, throw, don't just throw your hands up and walk away from your home or from your business. My staff will tell you that we have never, ever once turned away a citizen or a business who is sincere and wanting to keep their property. Yes, we're going to require a down payment. Yes, we're going to require a contract, but we will work with you. And again, Commissioner, I want to thank you for having put this together. Yeah, and, and let me let me also mention too, thank you, first of all, Albert and, and Gary for joining us. Um, always a pleasure. Um, you, you guys do such a great job of, of explaining this in the simplest terms. Um, let me also mention, it's hard to, 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 to uh, accept this at some times, but you know, increasing property valuations within reason um, are not not a bad thing necessarily. It means that we're in a thriving uh, community. Um, you know, people want to live in Bear County. There are people moving here every day, um, and and the fact that you know your home is probably your biggest asset in terms of uh, value, um, and that is retaining its its uh, valuation, but also increasing over time. Uh, it certainly makes it a great investment. But again, you know, we want to make sure it's within reason. I, I want to point that out because we all get a little bit, um, you know, hot, hot under the collar when it comes to these protests or the appraisals. Um, but I think it's, um, you know, something that's overall not a bad thing, but it has to be measured and it has to be justified, right? And, and I think to Gary's point, you know, you can't be out of whack with your neighbors in terms of um, that price per, per uh, square foot. Um, I, I had a question, you know, from from another constituent asking about, you know, sidewalks and crosswalks, and and you know, this is how we pay for these improvements, right? I mean, we have uh, the county, particularly those who live in un unincorporated Bear County, um, where you know the 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 Bear County is the, is the sole provider of the basic infrastructure. So uh, the main source of our revenues here at the county are property tax revenues. Um, and as the county continues to grow, can, uh, particularly in those unincorporated areas, um, that's how we deliver those services, not just infrastructure, but public safety and, and um, deputies and, 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 and folks on the street who, who can help um, keep our community safe. So, um, so it's been a great discussion. Listen, I want to thank you again. 
uh, for those constituents that are that are still with us, feel free to reach out um, either to my office um, by email or uh, go to our our uh, Facebook page and, and ask us questions there. We um, really appreciate your input and and uh, you make us better public servants. I know I speak on behalf of Albert uh, by saying that as well. So thank you all for joining us. And uh, again, this will be recorded and uh, put on YouTube and our Facebook page. Everybody have a great evening. Thanks again. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you.